Hello and welcome. I'm Kenneth Kukie. I'm a senior editor at The Economist, and I'm the host of the Babbage Weekly Technology Podcast for The Economist. And I'm here today with Javier Soltero, the vice president and general manager of Google Workspace. And we're going to talk about the future of work. Hello, Javier. Hello there. Javier, the world has suffered a calamity in which we've all had to stay at home with our kids. And we're also trying to be productive. How are we going to do that in the future? Uh, we are going to uh, feed lots of candy to the children, uh, put them in front of the largest screen we can find, and then run away very quickly. Uh, no, that won't work. We've, I, I've been my best uh, <laughs> uh, no, actually, look, I think, you know, we, we've learned a lot, I would say, collectively over the last year. It's been about a year of this. And uh, uh, many of us have had to make a lot of adjustments in terms of uh, uh, how we approach the task of living our lives, managing our personal responsibilities, and then also doing our jobs. And I'd, I'd like to think that we, we have, I think the way that I look at it is we've proven that it is possible to do everything from having children uh, uh, learn through remote uh, education and instruction to you know, running government operations, providing healthcare, uh, uh, running companies of all shapes and sizes, uh, uh, using a more distributed and remote approach, it's far from perfect. And there are definitely a lot of things I think that we need to continue to work on to make the experience better. But I think that existence proof of the possibility that we can approach work, generally speaking, uh, in a different way is incredibly important and the source of a lot of optimism for us uh, as to how, as Google, we can continue to steer uh, uh, and enable the future of collab collaboration and communication. Okay, so we are never going back to the way it was before in which our bosses felt like we weren't actually productive or doing our work unless they could see our backs as we were facing the screen, typing furiously inside of an office. And interestingly, right. this moment has shown that we can actually not only be productive working remotely, for some professions and some professionals, we've been more productive working remotely. But there's so many problems with it. The fact that when we were telling a joke to each other, our voices colluded virtually, sort of just shows the degree to which there's all of these obstacles and problems when we try to actually take our work and put it onto a virtual setting. So how can technology not just allow us to do our work, but overcome some of those problems? Uh, so I'll start by kind of capturing what the problems are. We, we've been thinking a lot about this, obviously, and paying close attention to you know, what we see across our users and customers around the world. And it comes down to three core issues. The first one is we've gone to a world where work which I'm using that term rather loosely to include everything from actual work that you do as part of making a living to uh, education and to even just personal tasks and productivity you have to do. Work is no longer defined by the location that it takes place in. Now, admittedly, we're all, a lot of us anyway, are stuck at home, uh, although there are plenty of people that are out there still uh, doing frontline essential work. Uh, but this idea that the work, the definition of work is not, no longer you know, directly associated with the desk that you sit in or the location or the group of people that you sit amongst is a really important and uh, big source of change. The second is that as a result of the change in terms of where work takes place, uh, the task of managing our time and our attention becomes incredibly critical, right? Uh, between the sheer number of things, you know, both technology things as well as uh, external things that are demanding our attention and the the combination of things we're doing in, in one single place, whether it's trying to, you know, take care of our children or family members or loved ones while we attend, you know, to our, our jobs or anything like that, we, we have to actually figure out how to not just be more productive or effective, but actually direct our attention appropriately. And the third is uh, the, so the subject of human connection, right? Anything that we do as humans that is difficult to do, whether it's like raising children all the way to launching spacecraft into orbit, uh, requires groups of people together to not only bring their, their best and brightest ideas, but to also establish a sense of trust and connection that enables 
difficult or impossible things to actually happen. And achieving that in a virtual sort of disconnected setting is incredibly difficult. So across all of those three things, there's tons of opportunity, not just for like new products and technical innovation, but for us to really uh, uh, study how our behavior and our approach can lead to a, a new hybrid approach to work that takes full advantage of that uh, uh, while still acknowledging that there are certain things that we have to do that require us to sit together and 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 get in front of a, a whiteboard or establish kind of a personal bond with each other, et cetera. Okay, can you be more specific about how the technology can help us? And the domain I wanna look at and think about is collaboration. And the reason why I pick on that is we all have to not just simply work by ourselves, but as we've started collaborating, in the last year, I've been amazed by the degree to which I've been able to do it personally at The Economist far easier than ever before. And it's actually opened up entirely new possibilities of, and it will take you know, journalism, joint authorship of material. Now, prior to COVID, the idea that two correspondents were gonna work together was always an aspiration. But now when you put it into say an online you know, editing system, it becomes a lot easier. Now you have to learn a protocol and a politeness and a decorum, and that's new, but it is enabling, I'm amazed, new forms of innovation that you hadn't seen before. So there's a, 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 an interesting social contract that governs all types of communication and collaboration. When you're sitting inside of a physical office and working you know, uh, shoulder to shoulder with colleagues, uh, uh, that contract is still there. It's just not nearly as visible as it is when you're remote. But to give you some specific examples, well, first, look, I'm proud to say that Google actually kicked off and has led the charge in, in, in truly bringing collaboration directly into day-to-day uh, uh, -day products like you know, the creation of documents, the creation of spreadsheets, presentations, et cetera. We pioneered uh, and have led the charge on changing the way that people can come together to create content and then ultimately share it amongst themselves or with other you know, people external to their organization in the easiest, most effective way. Now, when we get to a world like the one we're living in now, where we have everyone or nearly everyone fully distributed and you lack that social contract, there's a set of additional things that we have to add to make this even more effective. To look at this a different way, just merely having the maximum number possible of people on a video call, how many people, how many little boxes of faces can you fit into a grid? That isn't actually effective. That doesn't foster human connection. All that does is it actually, in a way, overloads your brain. The important question is, what, what can you do when you're gathered together? And for that reason, this is the whole genesis of the Google Workspace uh, effort that we launched last year, is combining the existing inherently collaborative uh, capabilities we have with the ability to see and hear each other at the right time so that we can get as close as possible to feeling like we're actually in the same place working together. And as we move through the course of 2021 and hopefully get to a world where uh, uh, the pandemic is more under control and people can start returning to office and, and, and organizations around the world embrace the opportunity and the flexibility of approaching the, the real need that people still have to get together in physical space to work together, how do you actually preserve a sense of collaboration equity, for lack of a better term, so that the people that are actually together in the same room uh, are, are not in a more advantaged position than those that are actually remote trying to participate in the same effort? And that requires a complete rethinking of the technology, the tools, and then also ultimately the culture of the organizations that govern around this. This is not strictly a technology problem. What technology can do is present the right set of uh, uh, core capabilities and make it really easy and straightforward for people to then apply their own approaches and the things that might be unique to their working environment. So let's dwell on this a little bit because it's so essential. The birth of the personal computer at Xerox Park, then at IBM, and, and, and more importantly at Apple, was actually mm -hmm. a response to the mainframe world in which the actual technical architecture of the company 
sort mm -hmm. of created the first mirrored, but then re sort of cemented in the culture of a company. And when we created right. the personal computer, we were able to decentralize it and we were able to give a lot more autonomy to executives. You know, suddenly executives started not only having to translate their own documents if they spoke a foreign language, but more importantly, they had to type their own memos. They didn't have, you know, assistants and secretaries, as we call them in the past. They started doing their own expenses. Okay, so their work expanded. But what was interesting was it was liberating because there was no IT guy that told them what they could and could not do. And you saw in the 1990s with the re-engineering of the organization, an incredible flowering of productivity because of it. Now, you have been everywhere in your career from Netscape to VMware to Office Productivity Suites to a CEO and an entrepreneur of other companies that have been acquired. So you've sort of seen that arc that I've just described. What does the future look like? Well, we're in the middle of crafting it as we speak. I think, look, the future, and this is interesting because working at Google, Google actually has been redefining even what physical office space looks like from the very beginning, you know, having a much more uh, campus oriented approach, having a, a uh, uh, an experience for employees that fostered the kind of creativity and collaboration that no technical solution could ever really capture, right? And fortunately now, as we look at, you know, the process of returning to work over the course of 2021 and what's beyond that, we have the ability to say it's a mix of a different approach to uh, uh, the actual design and, and use of physical facilities. The office itself has to change, uh, just like we've kind of uh, gone through an arc of like, is it all about cubicles or is it all about open plan? These things, they're never quite absolute, right? Like we have to find uh, a, a middle ground of like a combination of shared spaces, conference rooms and focus areas, and then enable the right kind of culture so that people can apply or use those spaces effectively. Along with that comes a set of different technologies, which again, going back to this collaboration equity issue, need to be able to not just make sure people are connected, that we've done, right? But also make sure that there aren't disadvantages for people that are in different locations or people that aren't, you know, necessarily, we, you know, even all the way out to the type of skill set that somebody might have. Like this issue of collaboration equity isn't just a question of like who's on site and who's remote. It goes all the way out to like, you know, a frontline worker who, who needs to participate in collaboration and communication, but might have a different skill set, might have different types of devices uh, accessible to them, uh, and even an end customer who might also benefit from having an interaction with people from an organization. But again, is that end customer going to want to be using an office productivity solution uh, and a product, a set of products that was designed from the PC era, as you mentioned, in order to uh, uh, just you know get healthcare or 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 interact with their bank? No, right? Like. Technology has been demystified. We now actually all understand how this works. People have phones and other devices readily accessible to them. And so I think the future, as we shape it, particularly over the course of this year and in the opportunity we have, is going to look a lot more like a blended version of uh, what we had, where we, we're, we're all going to go back to an office in some form, right? I think most of us clamor for that. We really need a little bit of better separation between our, our personal lives and our work lives. And I think it's more productive for people to, to, to have that change. Uh, but we're gonna be able to manage our time better so that we have more flexibility in how we approach that. And we're also gonna be able to find newer ways of building that sense of connection, both physically by sitting there and having coffee like we used to do back in the day, and also virtually by not only seeing and hearing each other, but also incorporating things like what we've already done, like means of expression and ways in which we can say, hang on a second, let me just show you that and drawing on a Jamboard or on a, you know, on a virtual surface or, or going from a, a live conversation directly into a document. Those things are actually not, not that far away from us, but they really change the way we approach work. And I really, I'm, it's incredibly exciting for us. You know, that's great. I'm, I'm so inspired when I hear you 
say all of that, in part because um, if we have on one side of, of the equation productivity, and I believe that actually we're going to be a lot more productive. In fact, I think it favors certain people to be a lot more productive working from home without the din of the office. On the other hand, as you point out, we're also going to need that separation as well. And the technology can help us actually even achieve better work-life balance, perhaps, certainly does away with the commute, but also in other ways, you know, we'll see if we're actually working too much. Uh, we might sort of have an automated uh, sort of signal to say, hey, take a pause, relax. You're not in your flow state anymore. You come back. And so I think it's going to be a, it's going to be quite glorious to see how this unfolds. So Javier, thank you. Uh, we've been talking to Javier Saltero, the Vice President and General Manager of Google Workspace.